Take a good look. Take a better look. Open your mind. Your mind needs to be opened for a program like Untitled Project. In the next 22 minutes we will try to enrich your life with art. Let's start with Tracy Emin and her latest work called My Bed. Fourteen and a half years ago, but yesterday I actually got in the bed and got underneath the covers. I had to to make it because when I make the bed, I get I have to make the bed and then I get underneath and then snuggle and then throw the covers over. Otherwise, it would look too contrived. It looks too too fake. But this is real. My body was in this bed yesterday. At the end, the aesthetic aspects have to be really important. If it was done wrong, or if it was installed wrong, I, I couldn't cope with it. When I was installing yesterday and I picked the things up, like I pick up the, the, I pick up the bloody condoms, the condoms with blood on, I haven't had sex for years. I haven't used condoms for years. I haven't seen a condom for years. I haven't had a period for years. There's contraceptive pills there, vodka, cigarettes. I haven't smoked for 10 years. So all of these, there's, there's uh, knickers with, with blood stains on, tampons with blood on. I haven't had a period for years. So all of these things that I'm looking at are all my past that's never, ever, ever coming back. So when I'm installing it, the emotions and the things that I'm going through are nothing to do with installing an artwork. I really cut off and linked into my past quite heavily. And especially when I got in the bed just then, I could smell it. I could still smell the same smell from when I was last in that bed asleep in it. So it's quite a strange thing. It would have been an absolute nightmare yesterday if I hadn't have come and installed it. If I'd have left it to someone in the museum to do it, no matter how hard they tried, I wouldn't have been happy about it. I might have come to see it and gone crazy. And Once um, it was installed somewhere and I turned up and I went mad and it was just before the opening and I took everything off and, and went crazy and then just put it all back together really quickly and really well. Even if I, if I was born 100 years ago, I'd still be making the same work. I'm not coming from um, a contemporary tradition. I'm coming from, like, I'm Van Gogh. I'm Egon Schiele. I'm Edvard Munch. I'm working with my emotions. I'm not working with controversial contemporary ideas of openness or, like, um, real-time TV or Facebook or anything. I'm not interested, remotely interested in that at all. I like writing letters and reading books. Okay, first of all, when I disclose things, I mustn't hurt anybody else. I can hurt myself, but I mustn't hurt anyone else. I mustn't name anybody else. And when I was younger, before I was well known, I felt like with my tent, for example, I put all those names in my tent. I would never do that now because I'd be too protective. I censor myself. I censor myself continuously. And I sort of think, would I be happy with this? Could I live with this? And when I made this bed, um, I made it for a show in Japan. In to I had a solo show in Japan, in Tokyo. No one knows who I am in Tokyo. And even if they knew my name, they didn't know me. So it was in, in a really different context that I showed it in. Everything is about context. I call myself a feminist, but not a feminist artist. All women have to be feminists. Even if you live in Western society, where everything seems great and everything fi seems fine, up the road there's a woman 
being beaten to death. Down the road, there's a woman being burnt to death. In other countries, women have no rights, no social rights. You know, the, this world is still very, very retarded and backwards towards women's rights and equality. And it certainly isn't equal in the art world. I might be doing better than a lot of men, but I'm not doing it as well as the men who are my peers and contemporaries. And that's the same within the whole of society, within women. There wasn't much that I could do. Art was somehow, I could draw, or not draw, but I was talented, creative. So I managed to get into art school. So and that was a long time ago. So yeah, I left art school in my degree in 1986. So I've been doing it a long time. And professionally, 20 years, I've been making a living as an artist. Is your mind still open? Let's give it some candy, in the form of a CGI animation called Grag, made by a group of Utrecht School of Art students.
Amsterdam we go to San Diego. An artist collective came up with the idea to make a children's playground out of trash. For most of us, this is just trash. But for artists, this can be both inspiration and material. Caves can be made out of cardboard, plastic bags turn into jellyfish, and garbage bags can come to life. They're making the journey of what happens from the moment you put trash into your black or blue recycling can at home, and how does it end up at Miramar Landfill? And I think there's something in that magic of the transformation of trash into something else that every kid connects to. Trash is the latest exhibit to go on view at the new Children's Museum in downtown San Diego. And our audience is not a sophisticated art audience. Ooh. They're two, three, seven years old, and we know that for them, transformation gets their attention, that act of magic. We visited some of the artists as they were installing their pieces for trash. Jason Rognes makes large spaceship-looking sculptures out of the styrofoam inserts used to package electronic equipment. Like for me, like the simple manipulation of a material into something completely different, like something even otherworldly, is like one of the, the real kind of joys and fascinations that I have with working with the material. Inspired by the foam waves create when they crash to shore, Jessica McCamley created a piece out of white plastic bags. White plastic bags seem like the perfect solution. They allow light to pass through. They can be dense when they're built up. They can have this kind of translucence. Um, you can have this like very like meditative moment with that. And then you have the reality of, of what that is and, and what's going to happen when that bag lands. McCamley hopes kids will lie down under her piece and unwind. Of course, with young ones, unwinding can be a challenge. <laughs> Curator Rachel Teagle hopes trash helps educate kids and their families. We know that in the area of environmental sustainability, kids are already the leaders in their home, teaching their parents about why plastic grocery bags can really hurt sea life. We know that kids are already way ahead of us adults on issues of recycling. And what I really hope we can achieve is to empower kids to help change the behaviors at home. Jeff Wall will have a solo exhibition starting March 2014 in the Stadelec Museum. My name is Jeff Wall. I'm a photographer from Vancouver, Canada. Since it's the first time I showed here, we wanted to have a reasonable selection of pictures that show the different directions my work's gone in over the past 30 or so years. Because a lot of the things I started doing in the 70s I'm still doing, they still can represent at least that direction of what I'm trying to do. We have in this room one, two, three new pieces from 2011 that were completed just the last half year. I've um, probably gotten known for a kind of picture that I do that's done in collaboration with people where I'm working like a, a bit like a film director so that the things that happen in the pictures have been structured and performed. But that's not all I do. So in the show we have examples of that but also straight photographs that have no performance, no none of that. And I think that uh, it's the relation between the two kinds of photography that interests me. I'm not really interested in one or the other as such, but in the relation between the two. I work with film and I, I feel that uh, film is an uh, amazing technology that still is probably the most powerful means of capturing an image. So the hurry to abandon it, I think is something people are going to regret um, before too long. I don't feel that one picture has any necessary relation to another. I consider them singular, so they, they stand on their own. I imagine people might think, well, these pictures do look like one person made them, but they're not very similar necessarily. Or they don't repeat each other, or at least I hope they don't. I don't have to go in the street and capture something um, as it happens. I can do that, but I don't have to do it. So I, I'm free to have any starting point I want for my work. So in the case of um, the picture of the two boys boxing, the starting point for that picture was probably my own personal memory of boxing with my brother 50 years ago. And it 
struck me that um, boxing is a complex form of violence because it's not really just about violence and aggression. Boxing is regulated by style, rules, technique, and it's a kind of institution almost. There's something cultural about it. So when you're boxing, you've already accepted a certain relationship to culture, even though it's expressed through, let's say, conflict or, or, or even kind of violence. So that put those two boys into an interesting relation, and my brother and I were probably also in that relation. So that seemed to me just the way that the picture could begin. I'm a photographer like any other photographer. There's only one difference. I don't take photographs. That's the only difference. I do everything that other photographers do, except I don't take the pictures. Um, and by not taking the pictures, I feel I create a different space for myself. I could have easily gone to a concert and photographed uh, a band. But I like the idea that by not photographing, I start photography off on a different foot. So then it becomes a kind of reconstruction of what didn't get photographed. And then in that process of reconstruction, I have a certain freedom. And I also then have the advantage of certain techniques of reconstruction that I can use. The lack of color is a fascinating part of what photography is, and I, I, I always wanted to practice it. So as soon as I could, I did. However, I never know whether I'm going to do a work in color or not. So sometimes I started uh, working on something in color and changed to black and white in the process, sometimes the other way around. Working in black and white is, is not necessarily, uh, for me, a way of connecting to the beginning of photography, although I think that's important. It's simply to work in the medium in all its dimensions, black and white, color, transparent, opaque. So black and white is a part of my repertoire, that's how I see it. Well, I noticed that um, kids were playing war on the computer, their video games, whereas in my day we played outside with um, toy weapons. So I thought, do I ever see children playing outside war? And I thought, and I realized I rarely ever did. So here you see a little prison fort. They've captured some prisoners. And I guess the game is the prisoners have to stay there. That struck me as a good moment, an interesting moment where there's this action here of the confinement and the relationship between the prisoners and the, and the guard. But at the same time, there's a squad out in the field ready for more combat. It seemed like it captured a lot of the game, not just one dimension of it, but in a way two dimensions at the same time. I think that's a common way of looking at photography, that black and white somehow represents truth and color doesn't, but I, I don't believe in that. The real reason I did it in black and white was that there were just too many colors. My response to any picture, whether in terms of whether it's going to be in color or black and white, is just somehow whether the color adds to the something that I'm trying to do, or whether I feel it's an obstacle. The transparency in the light box is a, creates a very specific effect. It glows and it, it attracts attention in a way that no picture not illuminated can do. The presence of the light has the effect of slightly intensifying the illusion of the actual. You have a feeling that there's a little bit more than a picture there, as if there's something added to the picture. It's a bit like a, a very powerful horse. You have to learn how to control it um, because it has so much energy it can run away from you. I, um, I think if you're, if you're a film photographer, you're not so different than you were 30 or 40 years ago. We still have the same cameras, same film and so on. If you aren't using film, then you will be more plunged into this whole world of new software and cameras and so on. At the moment, I'm not interested in that because I don't think that digital recording is very good. Um, it's true now that with the smart, cam smart cameras and all that, you don't really need to know how to do anything. Whether that's good or bad or, I don't, or somewhere in between, we don't really know yet. It's, it, it, a new type of photography is probably emerging, a new kind of amateur photography which, which anyone can do. And that will probably change the shape of how photography exists in the world. And probably it means that anyone with a telephone can make a great photograph. The problem with that is, can you make a second one? That was Jeff Wall on his exhibition in the Pinchuk Arts Centre.
Starting March until August 2014, you can see his work at the Stedelijk Museum Amsterdam. Let's end today with some music made with instruments that are shown in the museum Chichi Y Tan in Kralendijk on the Caribbean island Bonaire. This museum recently celebrated its first anniversary. This was the fourth episode of Untitled Project. If you are a video artist and would like to show your work, email us at 3nltelevision at gmail.com.